Okay, so now we are on. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Franz Rojas Ortuste from CAF, the Development Bank of Latin America. And I'm honored to chair this session corresponding to the seminar three on water and inclusive health and food security, which is part of the World Water Week 2021 convened by CAF, FAO, Catholic Relief Services, the Michigan State University and the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. This session happens when we are all facing two crises, COVID-19 pandemic and climate change. The first one has caused many deaths and has put back millions of people into poverty and governments worldwide are working intensively to have fast recovery while also looking for a greener and sustained growth. In addition, this month has released the IPCC report on climate change based on physical science basis, confirming an increase of around one degree Celsius compared to 1900 and presenting concerning scenarios of an increase between 1.4 to 4.4 degrees by the end of this century, which impacts on precipitation evaporation affecting the water bodies, rainforest, soil humidity, and hence biodiversity. Both crises endanger compliance of SDGs, and we must stress that additional efforts have to be made, not only on substantial increase of all investments, either public or private, but also on cooperation, alliances, and new mechanisms, recognizing the interdependencies and the interlinkages between SDGs. In fact, now it's more evident that non-compliance of a target in one SDG can also affect non-compliance of targets from another SDG. During this first session entitled Water for Food, Nutrition and Health, the Global Direction for No One Left Behind, we will have the opportunity to listen to two high-level members, Maria Elena Semedo from FAO and Julian Suarez Migliosi, Migliosi from CAF, respectively followed by the interesting study conducted by Sarah Young from North, Northwestern University on the correlation between water insecurity and food insecurity in more than 30 developing countries. After that, we will have the chance to have a panel with Q and A's with Sarah and representatives also from FAO and CAF to deepen on the topics discussed in this session. You are invited to send your questions to that section at the chat box of the table. I thank you all to join us. Let us watch and start with the first video, please Arturo, from the message from Mrs. Semedo. Thank you very much again. Excellencies, special guests, ladies and gentlemen. Water is vital to life on earth. Water is at the core of healthy agri-food systems. Farmers need water to grow their crops, pastoralists for their livestock, fisher folk to sustain their livelihoods, food processors to ensure food safety. But our freshwater ecosystem, the rivers, lakes, aquifers, and wetlands that contribute to our global food supply and sustain high levels of biodiversity are under ever increasing pressure. Water scarcity increases pollution and greater competition for water resources worsen inequality in access to water all along the entire food supply chain, leaving behind the poorest and most vulnerable, such as small-scale farmers, indigenous people, women, and youth. Depleting freshwater resources, especially alarming for the agriculture sector, the world's largest user of water, particularly for the 3.2 billion people living in agriculture areas with high to very high water shortages or scarcity and water quality is worsening, leading to weaker ecosystem services and reduced capacity for food production 
and income generation. With less than a decade to 2030, we are not on track to ending world hunger and malnutrition. In fact, we are moving in the wrong direction. Nearly one in three people in the world, 2.37 billion, do not have access to adequate food in 2020. An increase of almost 320 million people in just one year. Water is key to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. Simply put, access to water equals access to safe and nutritious food. Which is why today, as the world deals with the triple planetary crisis of biodiversity loss, climate crisis and the impact of COVID-19 pandemic, we need to increase water use efficiency and foster sustainable water management. Shaped by this challenge, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations promotes sustainable water use through three interconnected entry points. One, technical and management options. Two, institution and legal framework. And three, the policy environment, science, innovation, and data access, underpinned by inclusive intersector cooperation, are needed to catalyze and scale up action in these areas. Through systemic, sustainable water management, we can reach better production, better nutrition, better environment, and better life for all. The recent G20 Matera Declaration on Food Security, Nutrition, and Food Systems recognize that new and innovative policies and responsible investments in agriculture and water management systems are urgently needed. Indeed, ensuring water security for all requires the recognition of the critical interdependency of agri-food systems and water systems. And I am sure that the global leadership here at the World Water Week can jumpstart the action needed to make sure that water challenges in agriculture are fully addressed in order to transform and make food systems more resilient. Thank you. Thank you very much for this important message, Mr. Semedo. Now, let's follow with the second message from uh, Mr. Julian Suarez Migliosi from CAF. Okay. Arturo, can you can you hear us? Just to share the, the second video, please. Particularly during these difficult times, it is to address the relation. Good evening, Europe. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. Special recognition to our co conveners, uh, FAO. Catholic Relief Services, Michigan State University, and CIWI. Your Excellencies, Practitioners, Maria Elena Semedo, ladies and gentlemen, 
I'm honored to address such a significant session under Seminar 3, Water for Food and Nutrition and Health. What a topic, what a challenge, how relevant and particularly during these difficult times it is to address the relation between water as a driver for sustainable development, for food security and for health overall. Let me start by giving a bit of a context. It is needless to say that water is at the core of sustainable development. Its contribution to health and nutrition is paramount, especially in times of the pandemic. Drinking water is vital to health and particularly to support nutrition outcomes and therefore to reduce child mortality. Water is also essential for agricultural processing and for food preparation to reduce malnutrition. More than 70% of all freshwater withdrawals are currently used for irrigation in agriculture, what represents about 20 to 25% of harvested areas to produce about 40% of global food production. However, and as Mrs. Semedo from FAO stated in the previous presentation, current analysis conclude that we're not on track to ending hunger, that is SDG number two, and I will add to that, that we're not on track either towards achieving SDG 6 compliance on universal access to water and supply for all. In fact, according to the latest data of the Joint Monitoring Program, about 2 billion people lack access to water safely managed worldwide. And around 768 million people in the world face hunger in 2020. That represents an increase of more than 100 million people as compared to 2019. So how to cope with these huge challenges? There's certainly not an easy answer to that. But the 2030 SDG agenda, seen under a systemic intersectoral approach, gives us some light in this regard. That is, besides significantly strengthening multi-stakeholder cooperation, we need to take into consideration that compliance of some targets under one SDG goal may contribute with the target's compliance under other goals and the opposite as well. Therefore, it is timely, and with no further time to lose, to discuss on the interlinkages between water and food systems. Let me put that into some context as well. In one hand, ending hunger, that's SDG number two, and malnutrition, requires access to safe drinking water. The underlying productivity and sustainability of agricultural systems are highly reliant on adequate availability of water quality. And moreover, water and related ecosystems, including wetlands, are important contributors to sustainable agriculture. But on the other hand, changes in food systems are also needed to achieve SDG 6 targets. How to do that? Well, we need to double our efforts, all of us, take the right decisions at the political level and act with determination towards reducing food loss and waste in food value chains, lowering pollution from slaughterhouses, look after food processing and food preparation, and also to look after environmental sustainability in food-based dietary guidelines. Now, let me give you a bit of a regional context with the focus on Latin America and the Caribbean the field for action for CAF, the Development Bank of Latin America. Our region suffers from the so-called triple burden of malnutrition. First, we still face prevalence of undernutrition in the most vulnerable communities. Second, we see an increasing prevalence of population with overweight and obesity. And third, we also face micronutrition deficiencies. While in 2015, hunger affected about 36 million people in the region, this number rose to about 46 million people on a pre-pandemic 2019. And the COVID-19 is, of course, exacerbating this situation. And FAO estimates that by the end of 2020, 60 million people in Latin America and the Caribbean were suffering from hunger. In WASH, despite significant efforts made, still 161 million Latin Americans have no access to water safely managed with 17 million people with no basic access to drinking water. Now, what do we need to do and what is it that CAF is doing in this regard? As said by the research uh, partners of the scientific group for the Food Systems Summit, where CAF participated, we stress on four pillars. Pillar one, 
we need to improve agricultural water management. This requires at least three types of actions. First, it is necessary to strengthen the climate resilience of rain of rain fed food systems. How? We need to recognize that rain fed systems produce about 60% of global food and are under severe stress due to climate change. So we need to promote structural measures such as terracing and improve agronomic practices. Second, there is an opportunity to strengthen efficient irrigation by promoting sprinkler systems and drip irrigation. And third, it is an imperative to level up the discussion and address water pollution coming from pesticides and fertilizers by including better and sustainable agronomic practices, nature-based solutions for pollution management and circular economy across the food system. The second pillar, I would say, we need to reduce water and food losses beyond the farm. How to do that? Well, we need to strengthen agri-logistics to bring production closer to the consumption. We need to invest in physical and digital infrastructure to support farm systems. We need to more invest in roads and harvesting storage. Um, second, closer trading and exchange. We need to strengthen our investments in telecoms and the internet. And also, work on added value, agro-processing and packaging facilities. This is an approach that CAF is promoting in the region uh, to foster a comprehensive and sustainable agricultural development. Pillar three, we need to complement water projects investment with nutrition and health interventions by first promoting joint projects between wash and irrigation for improved food security, nutrition and health outcomes. Mi Agua, uh, more investment in water program in Bolivia, supported by CAF in five different phases of the program, included rural water supply, climate change adaptation measures, such as watershed protection and micro irrigation projects for small scale agriculture. My water, Mi Agua, benefited, has benefited in its five phases, more than 2 million people and enlarged irrigation area uh, up to 42,000 hectares, which in addition to my riego, my irrigation program, will benefit up to 72,000 hectares. We invite you to all to watch the short video prepared about this program during the next session of this seminar. And second, by reinforcing nutrition sensitive agricultural water management. In fact, nutrition and water practitioners need to work at the farm level at the community level and at the government level to strengthen positive pathways between agriculture and food and nutrition security. CAF is very much aware of such importance and is developing it in some pilot areas of the latest phase of Miagua, my water program in Bolivia, under the name Growing Under Safe Water. Fourth pillar, and I finish with this, we need to increase the environmental sustainability of food systems. Government regulations and consumer awareness should be strengthened to reduce overconsumption of food, and further efforts are needed to reduce post harvest waste and losses. I'd like to conclude by saying that CAF has been largely supporting the drinking water and irrigation sector in different Latin American countries. The water food health nexus is evident. The key role of water for inclusive health and food security should be a must so no one is left behind. SDG 2 and SDG 6 can only be achieved if the water and food systems communities work together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julian, for sharing this insightful words, insightful information Hi. indeed. I'm delighted to be here. Now we're going to have the third presentation from Sarah Young, she's an associate professor from the Northwestern University, and he has conducted an interesting benchmarking water security experiences based on many developing countries. So please let us see the, the video. Meanwhile, you are invited to send your questions through the chat box, please. We invite you all to, to send your, your questions, your queries using the chat box. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm delighted to be here today to 
talk with you about benchmarking water security experiences globally and what that means for health and food. But I want to begin by putting this indicator into context. So there are many definitions of water insecurity, and, and most of them touch on one or two of these domains. Availability, we're really good at measuring that. Accessibility, the um, JMP's drinking water ladder does a great job of cap capturing infrastructure, safe to consume. We can measure that in a, in a number of ways. But what was missing, but experiences have not typically been measured. And that was really surprising to me. They give a really holistic picture and experiences are the basis of SDG 2, indicator 2.1.2. Every year, data on these are collected for 140 plus countries by Gallup World Polls, and they're reported out from the data are collected using the food and security experiences scale. So I thought we needed one for water. And in 2017, a group of colleagues and I got together to develop one. It's really analogous to the food and security experiences scale in that it captures universal experiences with water. And there are 12 of those that we identified and they range for, from worry about water to not being able to wash hands because of problems with water or having to change the food that's eaten because of problems with water. Each of these items are scored zero if this never occurs, three if they often or always. 12 times three is 36, that's the range. And we've set 12 or higher as a provisional cutoff for determining if someone is water insecure or not. These items can apply to the household level and that's the HY scale or the individual level and that's the IY scale. Importantly, these um, scales are both valid, equivalent, reliable, and brief. Now, if you take a picture of that QR code, which will also pop up in a couple more slides, it'll take you to much more of the literature, the blood, the sweat and the tears that went into making these scales. Happily, they're catching on and they've been implemented in sites in 48 countries by more than 100 organizations, including these that you see here. But what felt to me was what was missing was nationally representative data like that we have for food insecurity. So my university, Northwestern University, developed a consortium with UNESCO and Gallup World Polls to do just that, to collect nationally representative data on water and security experiences. So in 2020, we did that using um, the IY scale in 31 low and middle income countries, totaling about half the world's population. Now, there's a lot more to be said about what we found than I can say in these seven minutes, but here's just a little peek at the prevalence and you can see there's a great variety. But let me dig into this a little more and say which experiences are, are driving these scores. <clears throat> so along the bottom, let me orient you to what you're looking at. There are the 12 IYs experiences. And then along the Y axis, you can see the proportion of people who affirmed experiencing these either a couple of months in the last year or almost every month. And this is a talk about food and health. So I'm gonna focus in on the food indicator. So what this translates to is roughly 500 million people amongst these 31 countries have had to change the food that they ate because of problems with water. Now, <clears throat> There's plenty of speculation that water and food and nutrition go hand in hand. There's many pathways that could explain these relationships, but until now there really hasn't been the data to explore if food insecurity varies by water insecurity. Fortunately, we can do that. We can now have the data to test this relationship both amongst countries and amongst individuals. And we can see if those relationships hold up when we control for known confounders. So what you're looking at here is data from 12 countries. That's, that's all we have so far, we should be getting more. And along the bottom of the slide, you'll see the mean IY score for the country. Higher scores are more water insecure. And along the y-axis, you'll see the mean probability of being moderate or, severe, moderate or severely food insecure if you live in that country. And what you can see is a strong positive relationship. <clears throat> Higher national mean IY scores 
track with higher probability of being moderately or severely food insecure. Now, when we look at the individual level, <clears throat> the same relationship holds. So along the bottom of the, uh, this is water insecurity scores are presented a little bit differently. They're dichotomized. So on the left, you see people who are water insecure who are water secure. And on the right, it's those who are water insecure. And you can see that the probability of being moderately or severely food insecure is much higher if you are water insecure. And that's controlling for age, gender, urbanicity, et cetera. So what are the take home messages of this? The first is that the water insecurity experiences skills are useful and straightforward and, and generate really interesting information. The second is that water insecurity and food insecurity are positively correlated both amongst countries and within individuals. So if we care about food security policy or food interventions, it seems clear that we should be paying attention to water insecurity alongside that. And then lastly, I think we should be measuring with and collecting nationally representative data on water insecurity experiences in every country, every year. So in 2020, you know, we measured water insecurity in 31 countries. In 2022, I hope we figure out how to measure water insecurity experiences everywhere so that we have really robust data for decision-making. Thank you very much. Thank you to the funders. And I'll be looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Sarah, for sharing with us uh, this interesting information. Uh, I, I think now we are we're going to have the opportunity to, to discuss a little bit more on on the based on the three presentations we have seen. We have around thirty minutes, or perhaps a bit more, a bit less. Sorry, to to have uh, some questions uh, coming from the audience. So we invite you again, to, to, to send your questions or queries to, to the panelists. And we have the opportunity to have three panelists for this uh, half an hour. We, we still have a half. Uh, we have first the participation of Jorge Concha. Uh, Jorge Concha is the director of the Division of Technical Analysis at the Vice Presidency of Sustainable Development at CAF. We also have Patricia Mejias. She's an officer from FAO. Uh, working in, in many regions of, of, of the world, and he has a, a great experience working also in the field. And then we have the participation of Sarah Young, who has uh, presented already the, this uh, insightful uh, study on, uh, on water insecurity and, and food insecurity, or vice versa. And then we have the opportunity to discuss a little bit more on uh, that information. So, uh, we can see that uh, we again invite you to, to have some information. First of all, uh, I would like to, to, to have a round with the three uh, speakers. Uh, and I'm going to start with Jorge. Uh, let me ask you, Jorge. Um, Julian Suarez, our vice president, has mentioned uh, about the, the challenges we have in the region. And uh, CAF is mandated to work in this region of Latin America. And it, it has its own context and agro water environments that impacts the broader development on health, food, and nutrition. So, from your viewpoint, what are the priorities to accelerate food and nutrition through water investments for CAF? Thank you. Thank you, Franz. Um, and, and good morning, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to participate in this panel uh, about a topic of increasing importance to CAF. And uh, answering for your question, Franz, uh, about uh, which are our priorities, I will highlight two investment priorities. On one hand, irrigation programs uh, with a focus on food security, particularly through efficient and affordable access to rural irrigation for family agriculture. As you will all know, 60 million people live from family agriculture in Latin America. 
and 50% of Latin American food depends on family agriculture. In Latin America, family agriculture, it's mainly rain-fed and has a high potential for families to improve productivity substantially through irrigation, to ensure year-round water availability, increasing crop cycles, and diversifying production. In this regard, progress in the eradication of hunger requires sustainable agriculture, and both irrigation and crop rotation are strategies for adaptation to climate change and to increase productivity. On the other hand, I would like to highlight the importance of implement nutrition-sensitive WASH program. Many of the water programs will be improved, considering that marginal investments will be enough to create synergies in health and nutrition. A good example of these are WASH actions in schools. 40% uh, of the schools don't have a uh, aging service that includes access to soap and water, and even 16 of the schools in Latin America and Caribbean do not have access to drinking water, and this percentage rise up to 28% in rural areas. Wash programs in schools are essential to create early good hygiene practices and to contribute to a proper nutrition and health in children and youth. In GAF, we are implementing through technical cooperation, as Julian Sarit said, wash programs in schools that are in the area of influence of our water investment in countries like Argentina, Bolivia, Panama, or Venezuela. Finally, I would like to point out that both approaches, irrigation and wash, are of course not incompatible. Drinking water supply projects, either to expand coverage or to rehabilitate systems, will be enhanced by also considering micro-irrigation projects, especially in rural areas, because we see in the field that rural development depends on water for health, but also for production. Um, more important, because much of the production is for self-consumption. That was the original approach of Miawa programs that Julian Suarez talked about previously, where drinking water were accompanied by irrigation projects. Then they were split into two different programs, Miawa and Miriego, but they are applied in the same territory and we are developing pilot projects to also ensure better nutrition practices at household level. That was the Growing with Safe Water program uh, said previously. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, Jorge. Very important what you have mentioned about these links between uh, water supply and irrigation under a territorial approach. Uh, now let me ask Patricia from FAO a question. Uh, with the UN Food System Summit coming up, uh, some say that water is a game changer for food security and nutrition. Then how does FAO work with water solutions towards zero hunger and nutrition security? Thank you, Frank, for the, for the question. Um, let me start. Um, highlighting the importance of the UN Food System uh, Summit. I think this summit is bringing um, new ideas and, and platforms on how we approach the transformation of, of our food systems. And in the case of water, I think it's also important because for this, the first time, um, issues such as water through the entire food system, not only at the production level, but also um, at the fruit food processing level, at the consumer level, are being discussed. So, also in terms of actions, this summit is bringing um, will forge new alliances uh, between multiple actors, you no know, um, UN agency, the governments, uh, private sector, and and, and NGOs. Um, so, I think at policy level, uh, these new ideas and, and approaches will have to be incorporated in the agenda of the international community, such as, for instance, the Committee on Food Security and also to connect with the, with the SDG. 
So in, the, in this context, as you know, FAO is an intergovernmental uh, organization. So we work directly with, uh, with FAO members and, and to design solutions, uh, integrating water, water management to reach uh, zero hunger and, and nutrition security. And, and as Jorge explained, I mean, the solutions vary according to the context. Uh, and, the, and the agricultural system. We have rain-fed agriculture, irrigation, but we also have aquaculture and livestock and, and other multiple agricultural systems. So we need to, to, to have a good understanding uh, of the context before designing any, any water solution. So I don't know, for instance, in Africa, where, where most of the agriculture is rain-fed, FAO is working on promoting, promoting water harvesting systems. Um, um, for those who will attend the, the session tomorrow um, um, of this seminar, we will show a, a video of, of the One Million Cisterns uh, project in, in West Africa, where FAO is promoting this uh, water harvesting for, for, for agriculture. Um, also uh, in Africa, I was working on, on improving soil management to, 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 to improve the, the water content in, in the soil or, 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 or uh, diversifying production and, and, and using um, improved varieties that are more resistant to, to drought, for instance. Then in other parts of the world, such as in North Africa, where, where production is very much linked to irrigation, FAO is working on the modernization of irrigation system, for instance, in the governance of groundwater resources um, or in the integrated management of, of oasis ecosystems. Um, and then, well, in Latin America, where also CAP works, uh, most of the FAO works relate to integrated management of, of of in at, at, at basin level. So these are some examples of, of FAO's work in, in different contexts. Uh, the entry points cannot be only technical, it has to be at different levels, at governance levels. We cannot uh, expect that the innovation of technology will be uptake by, by the communities if there is no uh, um, the appropriate uh, governance uh, framework. Um, we also work on, on, on data, on, on improving the, the water data, so we have a good understanding of what are the challenges and we can design better solutions. So I think I can, I can stop here, and if there are more questions that I need to give more, more information, I will be happy to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Actually, I will have another question for you uh, coming from, from the audience. I see that we have many questions but before going to those questions let me ask to sarah one more question uh, and it's very close related to to the, to the study you have presented uh sarah a conclusion very clear from your study is that food security and water insecurity are positively correlated amongst countries uh, in other terms individuals who are water insecure are more likely to be food insecure Indeed, it's an extraordinary accomplishment with the survey covering 31 countries. And can you give an example how your findings will influence or has influenced policy or practices for improved household or individual water security? What is happening where uh, or for whom? Thank you, Sarah. Thanks for the um, kind question. Um, so it's early days for the HYs and the IY scales. They were only published in 2019, but I'm happy to say that there's a number of policy relevant implications that are already playing out. So for example, the government of Mexico has recognized that water insecurity clearly shapes food insecurity such that they have implemented this module in their national nutrition survey. And this will provide just really detailed information on how water insecurity shapes, for example, dietary diversity, child growth, all of these health and development outcomes that we care about. Related to that, UNICEF has started implementing it in some of their mix, so multiple indicator cluster surveys that will also sort of, I'd like to think of this as a bridge between the food world and the water world. I'm, I'm trained as a nutritionist, so I speak food language more than I speak water language. 
but I hope that I can bridge these two disciplines so that we are recognizing that food and water are necessary for economic development, for child growth, for maternal and child health. A third example is um, FCDO, used to be known as UK Aid, are starting to encourage their grantees to collect water insecurity experiences data in order to inform policy and policy change around, around climate change. So it's a large study that I think it's eight or nine countries in Africa that, uh, that this, these experiential measures will be the primary outcome for use by policymakers to understand what we need to do differently in this phase of rapidly changing climate. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Now let's go back to Jorge. Uh, Jorge, one, one question that is coming from the, the chat is about the use of affordable technology. Let me see. Uh, yes, from Amy Cripps. Uh, oh no, and from Hank Holstack to, to Jorge Concha. It says, you mentioned the need for affordable irrigation and wash one option to reduce cost of wealth technologies like manual well drilling, uh, uh, pumps, etc. There are many new technologies, for instance, as promoted by uh, AMAS and smart centers. How do you have ideas on how to scale up? I think the, the, the question is focused on how to scale up on the dissemination of new low cost water technologies. What are the, the ideas you can provide us to to disseminate more on affordable technologies. Thank you, Franz, for, for your question, um, for the participation of the audience. Uh, I think that it's uh, very important to, to, to think about how uh, from organizations like uh, CAPS or from the public uh, sectors, can we promote and to boost this kind of investment and integrations. Uh, for example, in, in programs like Miriego in, in Bolivia, uh, in CAF, in, in the first program, in the first phase, um, we, um, we support a, a investment in classical irrigation projects. Uh, but uh, with a second phase, we, um, we promote uh, a kind of a technical uh, investment like uh, micro irrigation or uh, efficient ways to, to irrigate. And these kinds of, of interventions are, are, um, are basics and, and, and can be promoted uh, through um, um, articulation of the different actors uh, involved in this kind of investment. I mean, the, the public sector, the private sector, uh, of course, the uh, communities. Um, this articulation of different actors, I think that it's key for um, uh, every development project. Um, for example, in, in, in CAF, uh, we try to establish dialogue with the national government, uh, also with local government, uh, such as states and municipalities, but very important with the community to get ownership of the project, of the new technology, to include their viewpoints. And we believe that this kind of combined approach between a top-down approach and bottom-up approach, it's, it's very important um, to, to our program. Um, I, I would like to, to, to stress that um, it's not uh, possible to carry out this kind of innovation uh, without involve not only the, the actors, uh, the players in, in the water sectors, but uh, we have to, 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 to reach out the, the actors and the players that are out of the water box. I mean, um, we have to, to involucrate the, the private sector, we have to, to involucrate the, um, the innovation, 
um, uh, the, the think tanks that are investigating this, this kind of issues. And, and finally, we, we have to, 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 to reach um, a, a more intersectoral approach to this kind of investment. And maybe the most intersectoral uh, player that um, are in, in, in our countries are the, the planning and finance ministries. I mean, we have uh, an, an understanding of uh, how can these technologies can improve um, the, um, the productivity of uh, our field, um, without this understanding, it, it, it will be impossible to create the, the fiscal space to, to boost the, the programs and the actions needed to reach the, um, our rural areas with uh, this technology. Thank you very much, Francis. Thank you, Jorge. Now, uh, let's go to, to Patricia. I, I see there's a challenging question. Uh, it's it's uh, actually sent to any of the, the speakers, but perhaps Patricia can help us uh, in answering. It's coming from Amy Cripps. It says, uh, several speakers have mentioned multi-stakeholder and intersectoral relationships within approaches to agricultural weather management. With that in mind, how would the panelists anticipate integrating non-traditional supporters of water security, such as non-production animal welfare into food system interventions? And she adds, working animals are an essential pathway for supplying water to a variety of food systems, as well as generating income, supporting livelihoods and facilitated gender empowerment but rarely feature within related planning or policy. Okay, so yeah, well, um, uh, thank you for the question. Um, so I think it's clear that the agri food systems are, are complex system, which is not only about um, production of crop production, but also about animals and about water, about the use of other natural resources. So we, we need to have a very good understanding of, of, of the food systems, of what, what are the different challenges, and, and also um, what, are, what are the livelihoods of the people. And, and this is why we, we need this intersectoral and multi-level approach that has also been mentioned by Jorge. I think all the organizations now working on, on water and agriculture and food, we, we recognize this interdisciplinarity of of the, of, of the agricultural sector uh, and also related to socioeconomic issues and, and the livelihoods of, of, of rural people. Um, so it's important also um, the work that us as international organizations have to do raising awareness on, you know, on our different uh, sectoral issues such as can be water, can be animal welfare in, in other policies such as food security, uh, gender policies, uh, poverty, uh, um, food security or, or environment. No? This, I think it's important to recognize that uh, all the parts of the sectors of, of, the, of the food systems are interconnected and that needs a, a holistic approach and, and a good understanding of, of, of the different trade-offs and, and risk. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Patricia. So we, we still have uh, five more minutes. So perhaps a, a question to Sarah. Uh, Sarah, in your presentation, you mentioned there is planning to expand the surveys worldwide for 2022. So what do you expect to achieve by the end of the survey and how to take into account the irreversible impacts of the climate change on water security? Thanks for that question. So yeah, we're in the process of fundraising to get together the pennies that are needed to implement this survey in 140 countries worldwide. It's a great regret of mine that we don't have data for this going back for the last 100 years or so 
in order to see how things have changed. But what we can do going forward is with this data, see how um, to see who exactly is left behind in terms of water insecurity. We can now see how water insecurity varies by gender. We can see how water insecurity varies by socioeconomic status. We can see how water security varies by availability and, and different climactic shocks. So what I'm hoping that what we can do is have this picture so we can see where we are now, where we are in the near future next year and see how that changes across time. Okay, so hope uh, we are very keen to, to see the, the, the final study covering the, the most of the countries because I think that that information uh, gives uh, a comprehensive uh, support on water security and food security. So thank you very much. So I think uh, we still have a couple of minutes more. <clears throat> Let me perhaps uh, try to, to have a, a very uh, short round again. Uh, with a couple of minutes from each one, please. Uh, so let me ask uh, Jorge, um, just a short question, uh, short question and short answer, please. Uh, also investors for development and transformation need partners. Would you as representative from CAF mention which partners are key in the water and food, nutrition, health nexus in your activities? Yeah. Thank you, Franz. Um, I think that there is uh, uh, two kinds of, of partners or, or uh, two kind of view this, uh, an answer to, to this. From um, a vertical point of view, of course, we have uh, the national governments, the, the local governments, the community, as I said previously. But in, in a horizontal way, it, we have to, to, to work uh, in um, multilateral banks uh, as, as, as our. Uh, we have to work with another sectors like uh, the health uh, authorities, the, even the, the social protections uh, authorities in, in programs that are com combined um, investment in, in water with uh, social protection uh, programs and, and, and intervention. And uh, as, as I said, we have to um, try to uh, articulate the, um, the, the visions from the public, the community, of course, the private sector, and uh, in developing countries as uh, Latin American ones, uh, the international community and the international cooperation, of course, it's a, a key player to, to promote the, the technical knowledge, the technical assistance needed to uh, reach a real transformation in, in the water and the nexus with the health and nutrition uh, measures. Thank you, friends. Thank you, Jorge. So let's go fast to Patricia. Uh, with the recent IPPC report and the confirmed escalating challenge on, of extreme weather and water insecurity, all food systems are at risk for production, stability, and nutrition. What are the opportunities, especially related to water management, you see as key to build resilience for food and nutrition? Yeah, so thank you Fran, for the question again. Um, yeah, I think it's important to recognize that climate change is putting uh, a lot of pressure in every food system. But at the same time, um, every food system um, and sustainable every food systems are, are also a major contributor to, to climate change. Uh, so I think this, this understanding on on, on this double entry it is very important for us to recognize that um, how we manage and how we transfer our, our food system is important. It is an important part of the solution to, to climate change. Um, we also know uh, there is evidence that water scarcity and extreme water events 
are one of the major drivers of food insecurity together with um, with conflicts and economic downturns. So, so and we know that water is, uh, is scarcity is a, is a is a very uh, urgent problem. We we heard from the the intervention of Adam Semedo the 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 number of people who are already suffering from water scarcity and the pre prediction says that the number of people will, will even increase. So, so it's important to take actions at different levels. So for instance, FAO, FAO is working with members to, to mainstream water issues in, in climate change policies, in national adaptation plans, in national determined contributions. Uh, so we are working uh, on this at policy level. Uh, then also FAO is working with other, um, other partners to upscale uh, investment in sustainable water management. Two important partners of FAO are the Green, uh, the Global Environmental Facility and the Green Climate Fund. And, and finally, um, another front is uh, to create uh, networks of, of, of similar or like-minded organizations that can share experiences. And, and for instance, FAO uh, launched an initiative, which is called WASAC, that brings together different partners from, from different backgrounds uh, to, uh, to strengthen or to promote capacity development and also to bring innovation on, on how to, to deal with um, water scarcity and, and climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. And my la last question goes to, to Sarah. Uh, could you please try to, to, to stretch it and, and have your answer in one minute? And uh, how this index we have seen it will help inform when water variability is now increasing uh, through climate change? I'm sorry, could you repeat your question, please? Yeah, how this index we have seen and the relation of water insecurity uh, could inform when water variability is increasing uh, due to climate change. Yeah, so there are a lot of ways that this can be used to understand the consequences of climate change. In particular, we can measure water insecurity in a place where there's been a, a climate uh, emergency, like a, a dam breaking, for example. And we can compare how water insecurity is similar or different before and after such an event. I think it's important to remember that water insecurity shapes not just food, but health and psychological well being. And the threat of climate change is captured in this indicator in a way that I think helps to see the holistic view of the way climate shapes well being. Thank you. And thanks for your short and clear answer. So, no, I think uh, we have to finish. We have three minutes remaining. So let me summarize uh, with this session and also to invite for the next session. Uh, let me say that uh, we have seen from uh, Mr. Semedo, Julian Suarez and, and Sarah, some very important um, sentences that I would like to, to, to highlight. First of all, uh, water is at the core of healthy agriculture systems. Uh, a second coming from Mr. Semedo, but also from Julian is that we are not on track to neither ending hunger and malnutrition, nor to providing universal access to water and sanitation by 2030. So we need to redouble efforts. Uh, and it's also related to not only investment, but also in capacity development mechanisms and coordination, especially between water and, and food security. So SDG 6 and SDG 2 have strong interdependencies and interlinkages, and 2030 agenda must be seen under an intersectoral approach. And uh, we have seen that from the study from Sarah Young that food insecurity has a strong correlation with water insecurity as demonstrated in this study. So it provides us useful data to reinforce actions on water security in order to reduce food security. I would like to also highlight some recommendations coming from not only from the speeches we have heard, but also from some documents on recommendation on how to improve agricultural weather management, not only in rain fed food system, but also in supplemental irrigation to strengthen efforts to retain water based ecosystems. And it's related not only to reduce deforestation, but also to increase nature based solutions to reduce water and food losses beyond the farm. So it 
it has to be not only to deal with the supply side, but also on the demand side. And it's also related with nutritional diets. And uh, we have to promote joint projects between wash and irrigation. We have seen uh, and a good example in Bolivia, uh, linking wash and irrigation projects coming all together, but we need to, to work more and also to include the nutrition component into these projects. And also to increase environmental sustainability of food systems. So it, it, it's very related with water, front, water footprint of diets. So thank you very much for being with us. And we invite you to our second session tomorrow around voices from the field to learn on very interesting cases on the nexus between water, food security, and nutrition. Thank you very much for joining us.